Welcome gang, Professor Steve here. Um, and this, this lesson will be pretty brief, but um, and essentially I'm just explaining uh, things that we've gone over already, or at least have mentioned, um, and just give putting a specific example to it, um, but can be applied to many different um, food webs. And then I'm also going to give some examples of how some of the, the effects on food webs and food chains um, are not necessarily due to the way um, uh, humans impact uh, sort of the food webs or, or the ecosystem um, and it's not always due to a fishery um, but but sometimes due to natural phenomena um, but essentially the main theme of this lesson is is trophic cascades and we've talked about this before I mentioned it um, in ecological context a few times um, and essentially it should be uh, relatively intuitive um, and if not before this course, by now you should you should sort of be thinking in these terms anyway. <clears throat> and the idea of a trophic cascade is that if you affect one part in the of the food chain, um, the effects can cascade down, and and in effect, by affecting one portion of the food chain, you can affect um, portions of the food chain uh, further further away than than one trophic level because of the cascading effect. Um, and now that we've we've gone over um, what fisheries are and the life cycle of a fishery we can um, we can we can put some specific examples to that so let's talk about let's use the cod fishery as a as a um, as an example um, so we can have this sort of before we start fishing the cod example of the of the food chain where uh, the cod population is relatively large um, <coughs> Because they're relatively large, the populations that are their prey are relatively small, or are kept in check. We call that top-down control of a population. Um, and so, because that population, the small fishes and the and the crustaceans, are is not really really large, then they do not over control or overeat the food, the source, the, the, the resource that's their prey, usually larger bodied zooplankton um, or other even smaller fishy, fishes. Um, and because the zooplankton population are not over controlled by, by their uh, consumer, then they can be quite a large population and they can consume a lot of phytoplankton, keeping that population at a certain size. And then, because the phytoplankton population is kept in check by their prey, then the ultimate resource, which are the nutrients, um, the nutrient pool can can be rather large in this scenario. Now, if we come in and we start to overfish this cod population, we reduce it, um, and if we reduce it enough and sort of reverse the circumstances and make the cod population the small population by um, by overfishing them, they're no longer there to top-down control their prey, so their prey population gets larger. Um, because because their prey population gets larger, they can now overeat the the zooplankton, reducing them. And because the zooplankton are reduced, the phytoplankton are allowed to to grow larger. And because the phytoplankton are growing more, they reduce the nutrient pool. So this is sort of before and after. Um, uh, we overfish a cod population, and the cascading, the trophic cascade effect is, is is pretty pretty obvious. And it's also a good place to point out that the thing that we can, the things that we can affect in the in the food chain can be anywhere. They could be in the middle. If we were to target large body zooplankton, probably not. But but we do target small fishes and crabs and shrimps. There are fisheries for these guys. So we usually are as humans um, for industry and economical and um, uh, and uh, agricultural reasons we're usually targeting these either these top two layers we're either affecting some way these top two two levels in the trophic food chain or directly affecting these bot the bot the most bottom level in a food web which is essentially the nutrient resources um, <clears throat> we are either we most of the time we're usually inputting extra nutrients. Um, so let's just let's just give an, an example of um, 
of how it's it's not quite as straightforward as this, right? It's not a single straight food chain. Um, it's not only one one organism or one population that feeds on the zooplankton, but it's many, right? And there can be cross feeding between populations. Um, it's not just cod that are affecting the small fishes, um, but if this is the prey of other fishes, then we get to be more complex. And then it's not just the fact that the cod is a top predator, but does anything eat a cod, right? So, so it goes both up the food chain, down the food chain, these trophic cascades, but it also spreads out throughout the food web because it's much more com complex than this straight chain. So if we overfish the cod, the direct effect isn't just down the, f the food chain, but up as well. Sea lions feed on cod, so we directly affect the sea lions. If the sea lions are out of food and their population decreases, then the or then the the, the uh, consumer that consumes the sea lion no longer has prey. Um, if the orca, which does prey, certain groups of orca do prey on sea lions. If they suddenly lose their food source. Um, their population might re decrease, but it's a lot more likely that they're just going to change food sources. <clears throat> so that's up the f up the food chain. <clears throat> Let's go the other way for a minute, um, which is the one we've already sort of examined in the in the previous slide. But so the prey not only are the cod reduced and they're affecting their predators, which is affecting the predators of their predators, but they're now no longer controlling um, their prey which means their prey populations get bigger, which means it could actually have a positive effect on a different predator for this guy. So we're not talking about um, necessarily um, how the uh, how the, this krill or, or, or shrimp population affects its prey, but we also could affect another predator, right? So by effectively reducing the, the cod population, we increase its prey population because it's no longer being eaten by the by the by the cod, but that makes there's that means there's more of them for um, seabirds to eat. Just as an example, so it's kind of a positive effect on the seabirds. <clears throat> so as I said before, the orca will probably or or any other predator in a food chain in a trickling effect like this may just decide to switch prey or will be forced to switch prey. And in fact, this is a case study where reduction in cod forced a reduction in in sea lion availability, which forced the the um, the orca to start hunting sea otters, which reduced the sea otter population. Oh no! But anyway, the 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 effect does not just stop there. So you have to start to say okay what used to feed on the sea otter population if anything and and additionally what did the sea otter feed on well sea otters usually eat clams so without a reduction of so with a reduction of sea otters you get a reduction of population control on 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 clams but not only clams they also eat sea urchins so we need to say, okay, what are the what are the effects that that has? What do these two populations have? Does something else feed on them? What do they feed on? What is their ecological significance? Well, we know clams from our benthic lecture um, are filter feeders, and and they eat phytoplankton and other particles and clean sort of are the filters of of the water column, right? They 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 consume all these particles. And so there's going to be more of them to do more of that, but this, what do the sea urchins eat? And the sea urchins eat um, large algae, essentially, macroalgae. And where the sea urchin used to keep something like a kelp forest in check, now that the sea otters are reduced, we not only have more clams, but we have a lot, a lot more sea urchins that need a lot more food, and so they, they decimate um, the kelp forests. Right? So this is just one example, and not even taking all things into account, of just how complex the trickling down cascade effect can be just by fishing one species, just by, just by unnaturally changing the, the population of one species. But the other thing I want to go over in this lecture before we, before we end it is that it's not always an unnatural 
um, cause that causes these things, right? So here I'm talking about overfishing by humans. Um, but we are starting to see that some long-term uh, climate or ocean circulation patterns, um, such as the ones we discussed in in, um, in one of the previous units, um, can have an effect, a, a big effect on on um, on certain populations and cause similar trophic cascades. But just as an example, so you know the the Pacific, the PDO, the AMO, El Nino. By these types of switches, in, in complete switches in temperature effects, due to um, natural global global um, phenomenon, it can have s similar effects. And we and we sort of mentioned that when we talked about El Nino, how the warm pool shifts, right? So everything in the east of the Pacific becomes cold, everything t colder than normal, everything to the um, and drier, everything to the to the east to the eastern equatorial Pacific becomes warmer along the coastlines and more humid and this can shift what, spe um, what species survive um, and what territories the ones that do survive um, live in. Um, and we showed um, you know some of this cyclical patterns with the the warm phase, cold phase, warm phase, cold phase of the of the AMO and the and the PDO and once we begin to see these patterns, because they're so long term, they're very difficult for us to understand very well, and we're still studying them. Um, but when we take some of these patterns, we can match them up to things that we previously thought were due to overfishing. So anchovy biomass um, and our an and and the, and the overall catch of of the of the anchovy fishery. Um, you know, once we began fishing them at a, to to a great extent in the early uh, or in the mid century, this past century, 1950s, uh, you know, we got very good at catching them. We had very high catches by the 1970s, and then all of a sudden the fishery crashed, um, and so did the biomass. And originally we thought this was due to a fisheries curve, right? And that's look, it looks exactly like a fisheries curve, um, and we thought this was due to overfishing. Um, and then eventually we had sort of a recovery um, within the past uh, few decades of the anchovy population and, and therefore the anchovy catches. Um, and so what we're, we've been able to do as we start learning more about these long-term um, pattern, natural, natural phenomena in, in uh, climate and, and ocean circulation is start matching these things up. And we can see that in between these two El Nino years, we had a lot of anchovy biomass. Um, and it was, it was in between these two that the, the anchovy catch picked up again. And so we start to say, is this is some of this due to some of this natural, these natural events? As a matter of fact, if we, we, we look at anchovies or sardines, um, at different parts of the world, the catch, we see that they kind of switch off. Anchovy catch, sardine catch, anchovy catch, anchovy, sardine. And and we're starting to think that these are maybe natural fluctuations in populations rather than due to overfishing. And they may be due to things like these colder and warmer phases um, due to natural, natural phenomenon. Um, but again, these things are are, um, even though we we've been looking at them and we've been counting our catches for many 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 years, um, we've only been really learning a lot about these things, these types of patterns, over the past half century or so, and you need very long term sort of study to 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 be sure that any of this really is correlated, but um, something to keep in the back of your mind. Thanks for joining me.